Hey, welcome to Drumroll. I've got with me today an Australian violinist who made her way to London and worked with some of the very best classical musical ensembles, including the English Baroque soloists, the London Philharmonic, the Hanover Band, and Orchestre Révolutionnaire et Romantique. Uh, she's taught at the Royal Academy of Music, directing their mammoth series of all the Bach cantatas. And she's now back here in Australia with her own orchestra, the Bach Academy Australia, under the patronage of Margaret Beasley and Sir John Elliott Gardner. Right now, she's tuning up the orchestra for a digital concert. Let's hear all about it. I'd like to welcome Madeline Easton. Hi, hello. Hi, nice to see you. So all these wonderful ensembles that you were working with in London, was there anything really um, strong that stood out for you as to what you picked up from working over there compared to just working in Australia? Oh, well, when I left Australia, it was 20 years ago and I was a student. Um, the last time I sort of did a whole patch of work in, in Australia uh, before moving back was, yeah, alongside my degree. And I kind of had a, made a promise to myself that during the course of those four years of my bachelor degree, I would try and get as much orchestral experience as I could. So I ended up working with the Australian Chamber Orchestra, the Opera Orchestra, the Sydney Symphony and the Brandenburg Orchestra. But like I said, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, going over to Europe and uh, finding myself in the first fiddles of the London Phil was quite an incredible experience. There you are alongside the rest of the world and there in front of you are some of the world's greatest conductors and soloists. So it's, it's, it's a real thrill. And I've learned too many things to tell you here in this little interview. <laughs> uh, but all of which I have hopefully assimilated for the better, hopefully. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it make make you so very professional and up with the play. Do you find there were different levels between Australia and England in how they work through their rehearsals process? Yeah, definitely. What I found was um, actually Australian players, we don't give ourselves enough credit. We punch above our weight in terms of standard, um, given our a small population. Um, you know, just given the existence of something like the Australian World Orchestra, we can see very well that Aussies are in top jobs around the world. So I think we're right up there, actually, um, standard-wise. Um, what I will say is that uh, the difference is, is that when you get over, over there, you realise that there are lots and lots and lots more players of excellent standing. And if you're not good enough on that day, there'll be 50 million people right there behind you ready to take your job. And that's very motivating. <laughs> You must, must, must keep yourself at an incredibly high standard 24 hours a day. And I suppose the other thing that I realised was that there's a lot less rehearsal time in the UK. Ah. I mean, I think if you, yeah, if you ask any musician who's ever lived and worked over there, the number one thing they'll tell you is that you have to get just as good a result in half the time. So it makes you very concise and very good at getting things right in double quick time because you often don't get more than a day or two rehearsal for a massive programme. Mm, mm. And no, no mucking around during the rehearsal itself either. You can't afford to. No, oh, there's, there's very strict unwritten rules about that kind of thing. If you're seen to be doing that, uh, you just will be quietly rubbed. Off the list. <laughs> out the door, out the stage door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, at your Bach Academy Australia as well is, is wonderful. So you got that set up. How long ago was that? Well, I realised the other day, I set that up in April 2017. Wow. So, we've been, yeah, 17, 18, 19, 20. It's been four years now. Can you believe that? Fantastic. It was such a great yeah. idea. So to set up the Bach Academy Australia, what's inspired you to bring that about? I had come to the realisation that I did want to come home to Australia and, you know, fundamentally felt that growing old in London wasn't for me. So I just thought, well, how am I going to get back here? What am I going to do to provide myself with something truly inspiring to come back to? And one night I just woke up and thought, I know what it is. Australia doesn't have a dedicated Bach ensemble of its very own. Um, that's not entirely true. There's the Canberra Bach ensemble, which we must mention because they're wonderful. <laughs> um, but I just, I wanted to do my own Bach ensemble, to be honest. And given the fact that I'd been working with Sir John Elliott for all those years, both recording and performing all the cantatas all over the world, I thought, you know, this is what I want to do and I, I can do it. I've got the qualifications now. And it's given me a real purpose. And you really did do all of the Bach cantatas, didn't you? Was that for Royal Academy of Music? 
yeah, not just with Sir John Elliot, but I was very fortunate to be asked by Jonathan Freeman Atwood, the current principal of the Royal Academy of Music, to set up and direct this wonderful cantata series that happened over the course of 10 years, Amazing. starting in 2009. <laughs> yes, yeah, so between myself and um, lovely Ian Lettingham, the head of vocal studies there, between the two of us, we got through all of the cantatas. How many cantatas are there? Oh, there are over 200. Holy. Yeah. Wow. We ended up collaborating with Maggie Faultless, who sometimes leads the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, and Rachel Podger, who obviously is a, an amazing Baroque violin soloist. So it was split between the three of us in the end, which was great because the students got to have different perspectives yeah. and different people, and you can only benefit from that. But I can't tell you how great that was. I felt I learned them from the inside out, having to study the score, having to learn the German having to see the relationships between the choral parts and the string parts and the winds and, you know, the way Bach word paints all the time, constantly trying to represent the meaning of the words through the writing. I thought that was the best gift ever. <laughs> yes, what an extraordinary yeah. thing to get through. So tell us about the concert that's coming up with Bach Academy Australia. Well, we've been given the chance to participate in the Melbourne Digital Concert Hall series, which is just a great honour. This is, has been the most extraordinary thing for musicians all around Australia. What a gift this is to us. Number one, it's given us the chance to actually perform live. And number two, it's given the population of Australia a chance to hear its very own ensembles in this awful COVID society that we have, we're having to cope with at the moment. So it, what a great chance for us to put together an hour's worth of Bach and perform it for everybody. I feel that when we're going to get up there on Saturday, the 1st of August, we will be pouring out our heart and souls to everybody across the country just to say, hello, we love you, our audience. We, you know, we can't do this without you. So we're playing for you. Yeah, um, yeah. That's what I think that's how we're going to approach it, really. And I think having it set up as a digital concert means you've got all those people out there that are not going to necessarily come into Sydney to hear you or wherever you might be touring. It opens up access to so many more people who get to see the live experience of Australian musicians performing high quality Bach, which is always lovely, no matter what you choose for your program. I know you do great programs already because I've seen uh, your concerts, but just to have such a really amazing quality concert happening live that they may not have been able to get to otherwise, get to the theatre, I think is fantastic. Yeah, we've already had people buy tickets as far away as the USA. Lots in England, obviously, because um, I lived there for so long, all my buddies are buying tickets over there. So oh, thank fan you. Base. <laughs> fan base in England. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the upcoming concert that's going to be on, what's the 1st of August? Right. Which theatre is it going to be filmed in? It'll be going out live from the Sir John Clancy Auditorium at the University of New South Wales in Randwick. I think it's going to be wonderful. So just as a reminder, that's going to be on Saturday, 1st of August at 8.30, and the tickets are going to be $24 per device. So if you want to share a device, you can, but of course the best way to support the orchestra is to buy more tickets, buy more and more. Um, Madeline, tell me about the program. We are planning a program of quite a lot of different aspects of Bach, um, I've titled it The Many Faces of Bach because he did have many different aspects of his personality, um, not just as a scholar, but also as a, as a human being. So we're going to start with that wonderful symphonia to BWV 182, Himmelskönig, Sei Willkommen, which is very processional and stately and it's just beautiful. That has a solo violin and solo recorder, which Michaela Oberg will be playing with me. And then we're going to go straight into one of his fantastic trio sonatas, flute, violin and continuo, very Italianate, very beautiful. As a centrepiece to the program, that miraculous six-part ricica from the musical offering, which can be played on harpsichord or can be played as six different voices. So we're going to split it up between the strings and we're going to have a flute on the top just as a kind of acknowledgement of the great role the flute plays in that piece. And that's an incredible piece of music. It looks backwards in time rather than forwards. So it sounds almost like Palestrina at some mm. moments. It's just incredible. Okay. Then we're going to be playing one of the obbligato violin sonatas, the last one, number six in G major, violin, gamba and harpsichord, which is one of my favourites. And then to finish with, we're going to do the first four contrapunctus from the Art of Fugue. Each one gets more and more and more developed and more rich and interesting in ideas, rhythm and texture. 
Bach never specified which instruments the art of fugue could be performed on. He just called the four voices stimmen. So I think we have artistic license to put them on string parts. I absolutely. I, I think he, he was very, very good at, at um, seeing the potential of the work, wasn't he? I mean, that, that's the whole thing about fugues and how they develop anyway, that he just seemed to have never yeah. ending supply of ways to develop his fugues out further and further and further. So to make a work which has no parts names that anybody can pick up a, a different part, it really just is how, how he thinks, isn't it? Indeed. But I think the nice thing about this program is that the very first piece is processional. It's an entry to represent Jesus' um, entry into Jerusalem or into heaven. And the very, very last piece Bach ever wrote was the Art of Fugue. So maybe we frame the whole thing with Bach's entry into heaven as it was the last. <laughs> Bach's life That's in just a nutshell. Music. Yes. <laughs> a summary within an hour. <laughs> So it sounds really yeah. great. So I'll put the link up below uh, as to where to get the tickets. And also they can read more about your orchestra on your website, can't they? That's right. Yep. Yeah. It's www.bachacademyaustralia.com.au. Just make sure you spell academy with an A-K-A-E-D-M-I-E. That's right. The yes. German spelling. The German spelling. Yep. Yeah. I'll put the link up here as well for that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much for joining me today, Madeline. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.